Okay. 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 Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to say a few words before this uh, conference. Harvard CMSA has been a, um, a member of this FRG on geometric methods for analyzing discrete shapes. And I'm very happy to see it because I've been uh, looking into this kind of methods for a long time. Uh, good thing uh, about 20 some years ago with David Gu. And I see uh, the whole thing is very fruitful. CMSA has been very interesting to support these activities. So I hope that the whole conference uh, would be very fruitful and exciting getting new results. Uh, although, unfortunately, I may be slipping in some part of these talks, but I would like to listen as much as I can. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. And let me welcome everyone to the beginning of the conference, the workshop on geometric methods for analyzing discrete shapes. This has been a timely topic. We have over 200 people registered for the workshop. So I think it's a, it's a subject whose time has come. Uh, I want to start by just giving a few acknowledgments to the people who've uh, helped put this together. Uh, first of all, the National Science Foundation has supported this workshop with a focused research group grant. And the, the award was made to David Glickenstein, myself, Patrice Cole, Fang Luo, uh, Tianqi Wu, and professors Yao, S.T. Yao, and, H, and also H.T. Yao here at Harvard. And uh, this is the second workshop we're running in this, uh, in this FRG. It's hosted by the Center of Mathematical Sciences and Applications at Harvard University. Uh, we unfortunately couldn't have it in present uh, in, uh, in physical uh, uh, form, but uh, we hope to do that perhaps next year. There will be some more workshops in this series. And uh, I'd like to thank the people at CMSA and at Harvard who are supporting this effort, including Anna Kreslovskaya from the Harvard Math Department, Elena Fernandez and Ryan Maloney from CMSA. Uh, thank you for all the help putting this together. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday, tomorrow and the day after at 4 p.m., there's gonna be some open problem discussions. And we encourage everyone to send open problems uh, to that interest you that you'd like to people to know about by sending an email to geometricproblemsfrg at gmail.com. Please join us for those discussions of open problems. So um, that you can find that email in the program also and uh, in the, on the schedule. If you have any questions during the talks, please send them using the chat window since we do have a lot of participants and they'll be relayed on to the speaker. So now, hey Joe, you are muted. Sorry oh, for the interruption. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. I hope you heard some of the some of that at least. Yes. Anyway, we begin today with one of two expository series of talks. It's my pleasure to introduce Christopher Bishop, who will give the first of the two talks on mappings and meshes, connections between continuous and discrete geometry. Thank you, uh, Professor Bishop. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Let me try to share my screen. Um, Okay, does everyone see a title page which says mapping and meshes on the top? NSF logo on the bottom? Someone say yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Hopefully you meant it, not, not just repeating what I said. So the plan for today, um, well, the idea is that in analysis, I'm a complex analyst, and we often want to map some complicated region to something simpler. So uh, there's the Riemann mapping theorem that says you can map a... Uh, any simply connected planar domain to a disk. And that's an example of mapping a, a complicated domain to a, a simpler one. In computational geometry, the, the problem is often to take a complicated region and break it up into pieces that are relatively simple, like triangles or quadrilaterals. And the theme for the two talks is that these two problems are the same or very closely related 
in any case. So for today's talk, I'm going to talk about how to uh, build conformal mappings, how to compute them. And uh, really I'm gonna focus on actually approximating them, maybe not computing the conformal map exactly, but getting a pretty good uh, idea of it using ideas from geometry, like the medial axis from computational geometry and using some ideas from hyperbolic space. And then tomorrow I wanna to turn the plan around and say, if we know how to compute conformal mappings, then we have an idea of how to do good decompositions involving quadrilateral meshes or triangulations with angle bounds, uh, either for polygons or for more general PSLGs. And so the first part is kind of older stuff. This is a, a work which I did about 10 years ago. Um, and the, uh, uh, the second talk tomorrow is um, some stuff from 10 years ago, some stuff from five years ago, and some stuff from about um, uh, five weeks ago. So things that are just within the last month or so. And so that's the, uh, the plan. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is uh, any problems? I would yes, appreciate we, questions. Go ahead. We, we can hear you, but I cannot see you. I'm not sure you made it. I did it, turn or... off my video. Um, oh, okay. I can turn no it back on to say hello, but I'm using my uh, laptop in a tablet mode, so I'm sure. leaning over it. And so most of the time you will just see the top of my head <laughs> if I keep sure, it. Sure, sure. It's not my yeah. best angle. So um, just because I reoriented my laptop into a horizontal position now, I was not uh, keeping the camera on. Um, okay, so to me, I, I've been studying conformal mappings since my PhD thesis back in the eighties. And so to me, it's a very natural, I don't have to motivate why they're interesting, but for this audience, I thought maybe I should say a couple of words. I mean, there's a lot of applications of conformal maps, but my own favorite one has to do with random walks. and so. If I think of a, a point on a grid, I can step up, down, left, or right at random, and I generate a random path by doing this. And I'm allowed to repeat points where I've gone before and go back up and down. And if I continue this for like a, a hundred steps, I get a more complicated picture or a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand. This converges to a, a Brownian motion, a continuous random walk. And the problem is to say, where does it go? What happens to this? We all like to know what happens to a random process. If we could predict random processes, we'd be rich. Um, of course, they're random, so we can't do that. There is a, um, a limited version of this that we can do, which is called harmonic measure. And so to do this, we're gonna fix a polygon in the plane. It could be any domain, but I'm gonna to stick to polygons today. And we fix an edge. So here's my edge over here. And we're going to fix a uh, boundary, an interior point. And here's my interior point. And then we run a Brownian motion until it hits the boundary. In this case, I run it until it stops there. And I'm gonna ask, what's the probability that I actually hit the edge I'm interested in? Well, I didn't hit it that time, so I missed it. But let me try again, and again, and again, and again. Well, so far I haven't hit it. Let's keep trying. Ah, I got it, got it on the seventh try. But I miss it on the eighth and the ninth tries. And so I've only hit it one out of 10 tries. So what we call the harmonic measure of that edge is probably about one over 10. If I jump up to 100 trials, I hit it 13 out of 100 times. And if I go up to 1,000 trials, I hit 126. So around 10% or 12% is about the harmonic measure of that. However, this is a very, very slow way of estimating the harmonic measure. And you notice that for these edges over here, none of my uh, trials hit them at all. And so the harmonic measures of these, the chance that the Brownian motion came in here and hit that is probably less than one over a thousand. Because I, I did a thousand trials, I didn't observe that at all. A much faster way of computing this is by the Riemann mapping theorem. So this is a famous theorem that says, given any um, domain in the plane, any simply connected domain, there is a conformal mapping. That's a one-to-one -one holomorphic mapping. It uh, preserves angles locally. And it's a homeomorphism. And the reason why this is, a, is, is good for a, the, the random motion problem is that uh, the conformal image of a Brownian path is another Brownian path. So if I start a Brownian path in the disk, I take its image, it goes to a Brownian path. And so on the disk, the probability of hitting an arc is just the normalized arc length. Brownian motion is rotationally invariant. If I rotate this picture, I still get Brownian motion. So here I've cut the boundary up into 5% intervals. Each of these has 1 20th of the unit circle and their images over here 
these each have 5% of the harmonic measure right here at the tip. That, that very small piece there already has 10%. There's two of those, those intervals. So for the domain I was looking at before, I could take the edge I'm interested in and compute the arc it came from. And it turns out that the measure of that arc is uh, about 11%. Except here, I can compute it to many decimal places. And doing this one computation of the conformal mapping was much, much, much faster than even doing a, a handful of the simulations of the random walk. So this is a, a much, much faster way of, of doing this. Now, the edge over here turns out that when I use the conformal mapping, its harmonic measure is about one in a million, approximately. And so that's why I didn't observe it before. I'd have to have done a thousand times more simulations than I already did. This edge over here turns out to be about 10 to the minus 12. Uh, one in a trillion chance of a Brownian motion coming down here and hitting it. That would be very hard to observe uh, directly, but, but through the conformal mapping, we can do this. So this is one among many reasons that we're interested in, 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 in conformal maps and computing them uh, directly is, is for something like this. So obviously, um, Riemann mapping theorem is named for, uh, for Riemann. However, there is a Harvard connection, which I thought I should mention. The first proof of the Riemann mapping theorem in full generality, that is not for polygons or not for smooth domains, but for any simply connected domain, even with a weird non-locally connected boundary, that's due to William Osgood, who was a Harvard graduate and a Harvard math faculty and chair of the math department at Harvard. And so this was uh, his main accomplishment in, in 1900. First issue of the transactions uh, was the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem in full generality. And uh, according to, to J.L. Walsh, this was the, the high point of, of mathematics in America up to that point, that, uh, that before 1900, no American had reached the heights that Osgood then reached. So since this was a, a talk at Harvard, at least in, in theory, this seemed like a worthwhile point to make. Now, we were really only interested in polygons. And it was known earlier that if you want a mapping of the disk onto a polygon, there was a special formula known as the, the schwartz christoffel formula. And you don't have to worry about the exact form of this. Um, really, I just want to tell you what the data that goes into it. If you're given the polygon, we need to know the angles, the interior angles. They go into this formula as exponents. And what you also need to know are the points, the vertices, where, where are there pre-vertices on the disk? Those go in to the formula uh, uh, here. But if you know the pre-images and you know the angles, then you can write down the formula. Now, the harmonic measure of the different sides, like you know this side, is the length of the arc. That's because the, the, the harmonic measure is conformally invariant, or the harmonic measure of, of this side might be the length of this arc. So if you know what the points are, if you know these pre-vertices, it's the same as knowing the gaps between them. And so we have reduced uh, computing harmonic measure on polygons defining the harmonic measure on the disk, and the schwartz christoffel formula reduces that to knowing the harmonic measure. So it looks like we've done this circle. <laughs> it looks like we've, we've gone, gone nowhere. But in fact, there's lots of ways for computing conformal maps numerically, okay? So there's a whole history of uh, methods for, for solving these, these equations. And so, uh, so I will not, uh, not go into, into any of these in, in detail. Uh, the picture that I drew for you was actually though done with the SC toolbox of Trevethan and Driscoll, the, the pictures I showed you before. So that's an actual piece of software which you can download. Around the year 2000 or a little bit later, I was interested in some problems which uh, involved numerically uh, conformal mapping to try to op obtain the best constant in a problem of William Thurston about hyperbolic three manifolds. And um, I realized that all of these methods sort of have the form uh, do this, and keep doing it until the answer stabilizes and probably that's the correct answer. Um, it wasn't like sorting a list of numbers where there's an algorithm which is guaranteed to work after n log n steps. It was more like, yeah, just keep working at it and eventually you'll get there. And I was wondering, is there a way to compute uh, the conformal mapping say onto an n-gon in a way where you could estimate the work in terms of n? And uh, after about five years of, of struggling with this, uh, found that there was such an answer. And so the answer was, you can actually compute um, the conformal map to an n-gon in basically linear time. 
but there's a constant which depends on how accurate you want. And there's a notion of epsilon conformal, meaning it's not exactly the conformal map, but it's an epsilon approximation. It's good to within uh, epsilon of that. So there's a constant depending on the accuracy you want. But other than that, it's a linear time algorithm. I might mention it's not a practical linear time algorithm. Probably most of the things on the previous page, most of these things would be more practical than what I'm going to outline for you. But I think there's some pieces of it which are practical and that I'm going to try to um, describe. Okay, now epsilon conformal technically means one plus epsilon quasi conformal. I'm going to explain what that means in following slides. Um, basically, the idea is that we're trying to build a map to a polygon. We're going to cut the disk up into pieces, and each piece maps over to a piece over here. And on this piece, the function is going to be given by a power series, a finite series, a, poly a, a polynomial, basically. And then we're going to have a different polynomial in each piece, and then we're going to glue them together by partitions of unity. And where we glue, the polynomials are, are holomorphic. They're conformal. They're fine. But when we do the partitions of unity, eh, that's not quite conformal. And that's why we get something which is sort of only a quasi-conformal, partially conformal. But basically, um, the point is, is that if we want accuracy epsilon, each of these polynomials is degree p, where p is log of 1 over epsilon. And this constant basically comes um, from uh, doing FFTs on these polynomials. It's a nonlinear problem, so you can't expect only to add them together. You also have to multiply them and divide them. And, and so the bottleneck is how fast can you multiply or, or divide polynomials. OK, so uh, let me fill in some of the, some of the details here. Um, you don't have to know very much about about quasi-conformal mappings. I could easily uh, teach a, uh, a whole semester course on this, but basically these are homeomorphisms of the plane to the plane, which are, you think of them as, as smooth if you like, and they map uh, ellipses to ellipses. Now a conformal mapping takes infinitesimal circles to circles. And so this is why we call them quasi-conformal because you're allowed to have a little deformation, but only a bounded amount of deformation. The, the ellipses have to maintain a uh, an eccentricity bound. So you can't have things which are arbitrarily narrow uh, mapping to a disk. And so if the eccentricity is bounded by K, then we call it K quasi-conformal, okay? There's a differential equation which encodes this. If you take the Z bar derivative of F divided by the Z derivative, this is called the dilatation of the map. And this turns out to be always less than, than one. The norm of this complex number uh, gives you the, the, the eccentricity of the ellipse and the argument of this complex number show, tells you what direction the, mac, the, uh, the ellipse points in, what the major axis is. So this complex number encodes the, uh, the field. Now, if you're not so happy with differential equations or, uh, or, or dilatations, another easier way to think of it is just most of the maps we're going to be talking about are maps from polygons to polygons, and we can triangulate and just think of affine maps from one triangle to another triangle. And so as long as say all these triangles come from a compact family and all of these don't degenerate so that the angles stay bounded away from zero and, and 180, you're fine. That's quasi-conformal. In fact, for a mapping between two triangles, if we normalize so that one edge is zero to one and the other, the third vertices are A and B, the dilatation is, is just this number. Uh, for those of you who know a little hyperbolic geometry, you might recognize this as the pseudo hyperbolic distance in the upper half plane. But basically, if A equals B, you have the identity map and this thing is equal to zero. And otherwise, it's sort of measuring how much the angles are, are being distorted. And so when you have a, a, a piecewise affine map between these things, all you have to do is check the, um, the dilatation in each triangle, which is easy to do because it's just a measure of the three corners. For example, we measure, we map um, this triangle say one to this triangle, it's identical. Mu is equal to zero. There's no distortion at all. Um, this triangle gets mapped to this triangle and there's some distortion. So mu is, is a little, is non-zero there. And if we map this triangle to this triangle, there is quite a bit of distortion. In fact, that looks like the most distorted triangle. And so that would be the, um, that would be the thing that determines the quasi-conformal constant. And so you can, um, you can draw more complicated pictures of this. Um, a triangle like this over here goes over here, but the shape is the same. It's just smaller. And so this mu is actually equal to zero for that triangle because mu doesn't count the size of the triangle. It only counts 
the, the change in the shape. And if you just shrink it without changing the shape, the dilatation is zero. It's basically a conformal mapping, nothing is happening. Okay. Now we can use this to define a distance between uh, polygons, uh, which is very convenient for, for what I have in mind. It is the, um, the best dilatation of a QC mapping between the polygons that preserves the vertices. So vertices have to go to vertices, okay? For something like a rectangle, there's an obvious stretching map in which you're simply expanding one direction and keeping the other one the identity. That turns out to be the optimal mapping. And so if this thing was one and this was two, then uh, the, the best K you could get would be two here and the corresponding mu would be two minus one over two plus one would be a third. And so the distance between these would, would be a third. In general, if you have two polygons with the same number of vertices, there will be some quasi-conformal mappings which, which map them and preserve the vertices. But finding the optimal one is probably pretty difficult. There's a nice paper uh, from 2014, which you can look at, uh, which gives a, an algorithm for, for trying to find these things. But um, in general, this is a, a tough problem to find the optimal map. For our purposes, we will just get by with an estimate, not the actual computation. If you can triangulate the two polygons in a way that is combinatorially the same. So what I mean here, we have, we can number the triangles and you notice one is adjacent to two and two is adjacent to three. And if we may label these, we have the same adjacencies and then two is adjacent to six and then six is adjacent to five and five is adjacent to four. So these two um, polygons have actually been triangulated in a way in which the, the triangles uh, match up. It's the same combinatorics. And so we can just take the affine map from each triangle to its twin down here and compute that dilatation. And that is a quasi-conformal mapping that preserves all the vertices. And so it's one of the things in the infimum. And so this is an upper estimate for the uh, quasi-conformal distance. Now for the conformal mapping problem, this is terrific because given, uh, uh, you know, so suppose this is the, tar the polygon I want to have, and I guess some parameters for the schwartz christoffel for me, and I plug them in and I get this polygon. I say, that's not the right polygon, but I can estimate how far away it is. And so I get an estimate for the distance to the correct answer, and I don't have to know what the schwartz christoffel parameters for the right answer is. What I want to know is, what are the pre-images of this? And I don't know those. Those are what I'm trying to solve for. But using this kind of distance, you can compute how far you are from the right answer without knowing what the right answer is. And that's a big advantage because for no other reason, you could just start doing random perturbations of the parameters and check to see if you're getting closer. So you could do a kind of a hill climb uh, using this. And so you could see, well, this has to lead to an algorithm for computing the schwartz christoffel map. And so, and it has to lead to an algorithm which is provably convergent. Um, it's just a matter of how fast can we make it go. And so the rest of the talk is about how fast you can make it go. Um, if you are trying to minimize a function, uh, a smooth function, using something like Newton's method would be much faster than just trying to do a hill climb on, on neighboring points. And that's what we're going to do here. In order to do, use Newton's method in the current setup, we need to use a powerful theorem from, uh, from quasi-conformal mappings. It's the measurable Riemann mapping theorem. It says that if we're given uh, one of these dilatations, um, that given a dilatation which is bounded by one, there is always a quasi-conformal mapping with that dilatation, okay? So this is a black box. This would be a pretty hard theorem to prove if we we're taking, giving a graduate course. This would probably take two or three days to go through the, the proof of this. It's basically solving uh, this uh, differential equation. I'm not going to say too much about it, um, except to say that it, it turns out that there's an exact solution using power series of singular integral operators, whatever those things are. Uh, these infinite power series, if you just truncate them to the constant and linear term, it turns out that that is what we call a D-bar problem. And you can solve that by convolving with one over Z, which is a much easier thing to do. And so the idea of solving this, 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 this general equation, the Beltrami equation, is you use convolutions to solve it up to the, the linear version of it. And then you use that as your new starting point. And then you solve the new problem again with convolutions. And then you get a new problem and you keep going. And this is just Newton's method where you're replacing a nonlinear uh, function by a, its linearization and solving the linear version and then 
and repeating. And it turns out that you can prove this converges as long as the dilatation is small enough and it converges quadratically. So uh, you can actually do this on a, on a computer. And if you read the paper, there's many, many pages about how to do this using structured linear algebra and the fast multipole method, but I'm going to ignore this. So this part of the problem, I don't care about. When you're using Newton's method, the critical thing is to find a good starting point. And that's what I'm really gonna talk about. In the measurable- yeah, Sorry, yeah, go ahead, there's a question. Bishop. Sure. Yeah, I think that we have a question in the chat box. And, Please. Uh, what is Aaron it? asked that is is this optimal quasi conformal distance between polygons comparable to the Tachimura distance between say doubles of the polygons? Uh, probably it is. I'd have to think about that, and it would probably take me as much time as is left in my lecture. But that sounds correct. But I would um, we could discuss it after the talk. I think I don't think I had anything sensible to say right off the top of my head. But it sounds correct. Sure, thanks. Okay. So the idea is given the disk, you build some QC map onto the polygon you want. Then the measure we run mapping theorem says, well, this thing is mapping ellipses to circles, but we can find a, a, an F mapping the disk to the disk, which straightens that out, which maps those ellipses here to circles here. So the composition is mapping circles to circles. It's conformal. And so the problem really breaks up into two pieces. It breaks up into finding some QC mapping into the polygon you want, and then solving the Beltrami equation to make it uh, conformal. And I'm just gonna ignore the second part. That's uh, kind of long and technical and difficult. It's not very geometric, but finding the good G, finding uh, this thing is, uh, is what I wanna discuss to you. And in fact, what I wanna argue is that if you find a good enough G right off the bat, it might be good enough for what you want. Maybe you don't even have to bother with solving the differential equation. Maybe you could just get by and use the G. I think there are various applications where um, just having that map would be good enough. Okay. So a good uh, G will be very fast to compute and it will be guaranteed to be close to the correct answer because when we apply Newton's method, we don't wanna start very, very far from the correct answer. We wanna start in a, in a, a neighborhood where we're guaranteed to converge and we can estimate the number of steps needed to converge, okay? Now it turns out fast comes from computational geometry and close comes from hyperbolic geometry. So let me um, describe each of these, okay? So I like to tell you about the medial axis. Uh, this is a concept from computational geometry, which it's the centers of all the disks which hit the boundary of a domain in at least two points. So here I've drawn a couple of them, but there's lots of other disks as well. In fact, if you draw all the centers, it forms a tree inside here. So each of these points is the center of a disk. And where you have a vertex, it means you're actually hitting at at least three points, okay? And uh, actually one of the members of the audience uh, here uh, proved that you can compute this in linear time. And so uh, this is fast to compute, okay? It's related to the idea of Voronoi diagrams because what you can think of is that given each uh, edge of the polygon, you're basically taking the piece of the polygon which is closest to that edge. Uh, this is not completely true because you really have to take certain convex arcs on the, uh, on the polygon, and then you're taking the piece of the polygon which is closest to that. But there's a way to interpret the medial axis in terms of runway diagrams, okay? Now, Given two disks centered on the Voronoi diagram, I wanna convince you there's a natural obvious map from this disk to this disk, okay? There's many, many uh, maps, but there's one that is sort of more natural than all the others. And this involves the idea of a Mobius transformation. Mobius transformations, as you do know, are linear fractional transformations. These are exactly the one-to-one -one, uh, conformal mappings of the sphere to the sphere. It's a group under composition and has the property that if you specify three points, you can find a Mobius transformation that takes exactly those three points to the image three points. And the way I wanna use it is I have two circles which intersect at two points and I wanna take this third point and map it to that point. So I'm fixing two, that determines two to three and the third one gets mapped. And in fact, there's a whole family of, um, you know, I could send this point C to intermediate points and if I do that, I can I get a picture that looks something like this. So 
So points on this circle are rotated. So basically what we're doing is we're doing a rotation around these two fixed points and points on the other circle are getting mapped in. These are what are called elliptic Möbius transformations. They have two fixed points. Now, in our picture, where we wanted to, uh, wanted to map a boundary point onto this disk, so we want to have some way of mapping this over to here. What we do is we take every boundary point on some medial axle disk. We take the path. The medial axis is a tree, so there's a path connecting these two things. And then we discretize it. We're going to take some points here and draw those disks. And they look something like this. And now we know how to map each point to the next one. So we're just going to take, remember, we know how to take up when two points circles intersect, we know how to rotate the one circle into the other one. So we're going to get a, a path like this. And this is something I call the medial axle flow. And so a point like this would just flow over here, and a point like this would flow over here. And any point on the boundary eventually ends up on this stick. So this is a mapping of the boundary of the polygon to the boundary of the disk. That's kind of what the Riemann mapping does. It maps the boundary of the domain to the boundary of the disk. Um, you don't have to discretize. I'm only doing that to draw the picture to give the intuition. There's actually a formula, a given, um, given the computation of medial axis, we can just write down a formula for this map in terms of the length edges and the angles of the medial axis. So it can all be done very quickly. Um, here's another example uh, where I've drawn the medial axis, I've drawn the medial axle disks, and then all we're doing is flowing orthogonally to these circular arcs. And you get this mapping of the boundary, the domain, to the disk. Uh, here's a polygon. And here's an example of the flow lines. You can see that if you start with an edge up here, these flow lines end up being almost the same point, which is what we expect because uh, an edge over here has small harmonic measure and the Riemann mapping would send this uh, basically to a very, very small arc. And so if this thing is supposed to be imitating the Riemann mapping, it should do the same. On the other hand, an arc like this, it goes to a, a reasonable sized arc. And then here's another example of a polygonal domain, not a simple polygon, but a slit polygon. And the picture here looks pretty much the same. Any questions about how, how this map is defined? So this is very fast to compute. Um, so according to the, uh, the Chin Soyang Yang theorem, we can compute the medial axis in linear time. And then it turns out all N of these images can also be computed in time O of N. So there's a little bookkeeping you have to do with cross ratios, but this mapping, given the polygon, it's an O of N computation. And I've actually written code myself to do this, so it's not, not impossible to do. The question is, my claim is that this is close to the conformal mapping. And how close is that? Well, one way of testing that would be to take a polygon and then compute these parameters we get from the flow and plug them into the schwartz christoffel formula and see what we get. And when we do that, we get this. It's not quite the same polygon, but it's very, very close. In terms of the QC distance I was defining before, the distance is about 1.24. So mu is about you know, 0.2. So this is a uh, fairly close in the, uh, in the quasi conformable distance. But if you look at it, it's hard to tell the difference. I mean, the medial axis flow has basically got the Schwartz crystal off of parameters down Pat, I mean, on the first guess. Um, so we, we could improve them, but it could be that if you're using conformal mappings for visualization or, or for something else, maybe, maybe this picture would be good enough by itself. Maybe you wouldn't have to do anything else to it. Okay. Now, there's a theorem that says that that error of that was 1.24 is never bigger than eight. It's always uniformly bounded, independent of what the polygon is. Doesn't matter how many sides it has or, or, or the shape. This medial axis flow always approximates the Riemann mapping to within eight. And that's why when you go then to solve the differential equation, you have to do amount of work which you can estimate because you know how far you are from the correct answer. And so that's why you can get a, a bound on how hard it is to solve that equation. And you get that, that linear time bound on finding the, the parameters. Now, why is this eight theorem true? And the short answer is it's true because of hyperbolic manifolds. And let me try to explain that. I think this is kind of a fun story. So um, let, me, uh, let me try to tell it to you. 
all right? Now, everyone in the audience, I hope, knows what a convex set is. The basic, the, the usual definition is that if you have two points in the set and you connect them by a straight line, that's also in the set. But that's not the definition that I really prefer, at least for today's talk. I want to talk that a, a set is convex if its complement is a union of half spaces. So if you take any point on the boundary, there's a support line, at least one of them going through that, and then one half of that is definitely outside. And so I want to think of a convex set as a set whose complement is a union of, of half spaces. That's going to be more helpful because we're not going to take convex sets in Euclidean space. We're going to consider convex sets in hyperbolic space. And it turns out that this is, at least for me, it's much easier to visualize, okay? So here's a picture of the hyperbolic disk. So the hyperbolic disk has a metric which blows up as you approach the boundary. And so it blows up like one over the distance to the boundary, basically. Geodesics in this metric, if you happen to have a geodesic going through the origin, it's a straight line. And otherwise it's a circle, which is orthogonal to the boundary. And so a half plane, in the hyperbolic metric would be one side of a geodesic. So it would be a half disk like this, or it would be a uh, uh, sort of a, a semi-half disk like this. And so when I look at a picture like this one on the right, I can tell this is convex. This, this, this purple region is convex. One way I could do it is by trying to check that whenever I drew geodesics in here, they always stayed in the set. But to me, it's easier to look at the complementary components. And when I look at this, I can tell at a glance that each of these things is a hyperbolic half plane. And so the complement of the purple region is a union of half planes, and hence it must be convex. And to me, that's a little bit easier than checking that all of these curves actually stay inside the purple set, okay? When we move to one higher dimension, this becomes even more of an advantage, okay? When we go to three-dimensional hyperbolic space, um, I'm thinking of this in the upper half plane model. So this is R3 plus, and now the hyperbolic metric blows up as you approach the real, real plane on the bottom. Now geodesics are either vertical lines or they are semicircles which are perpendicular to the boundary. Now a half space is half of a hyperbolic plane. I haven't said what a hyperbolic plane is yet, but hyperbolic planes are basically either vertical planes which are bounded by a line on the boundary, or more typically, they're, they're hemispheres. And so this is a plane, this is a two plane in hyperbolic space, and the inside and the outside are half spaces. So I can tell if something is convex, if its complement is a union of hemispheres. And that's, that's why I was telling you, you this story. Now I'm interested in taking the convex hull of a plane or domain. So, if I have a, a, a curve in the plane, I'm going to take the convex hull of the outside, okay? And one way I could do that is by taking all the pairs of points in the outside and joining them by geodesics and seeing what I get. That tends to be a little bit messy. It's a little easier for me is to think about the complement of that convex set, which means I wanna take all the disks which are in the domain and take the hemisphere over it. And that is a half space, which does not hit the convex hull of the outside. If you had a points out here that connect out, that geodesic has to go above every hemisphere like this. And so if I take all the hemispheres, all the disks which are in this picture, and I take all the, all the hemispheres over them, what I get is a, is a sort of a mountain range whose base is the domain. It's called the dome of the, um, of the domain, okay? And I can actually draw this on a computer. Uh, for example, the easiest case is when the base domain is just a finite union of disks. And then the dome is just a finite union of hemispheres. So it, it looks sort of like this. Um, if you have a smooth boundary here, I've drawn a little bit more complicated smooth region. What I wanna do is take all the disks which are in here and take their domes. And that picture looks like this. I don't know how well this is showing up over Zoom, but this is meant to be a, a blue range where the boundary curve is in the plane. It goes around here. And then this has some height to it. 
it, it, it goes up here. The way I actually draw this on the computer is I take our friend the medial axis again. Here I've drawn the medial axis. And each of these points is um, the center of a disk which is inside the domain. And it's enough to only take the domains of the medial axis. And you take all these hemispheres that lie above all these disks. And what you get is the picture I showed you on the last page. If you want a little easier example, you can just take a square. If you take a square, the medial axis turns out just to be a cross. So, and this picture, there's one big disc in the center and its dome is sort of here. And then there's, there are discs which go into each center and they, they sort of span a cone. And so this is what the dome of this looks like. And here's a dome of a, of a more general uh, polygon, okay? Now, what does this have to do with the medial axis? It seems, sounds like I, I, uh, the medial axis flow. So what does the dome have to do with that? They're very closely connected. So William Thurston, uh, back in the late 70s or 80s, he observed, I don't think he would even call it a theorem, he would just say it's sort of obvious, that any simply connected domain is isometric to the hyperbolic disk. So when you're on one of these domes, let me just go back here. If I have two points on the dome, there's a path connecting them. Actually, there's several paths, but one of them has shortest hyperbolic distance. And so the dome has a natural metric, which is the path metric in the hyperbolic distance. And what Thurston observed is that with that path metric, this is just the same as the hyperbolic disk. It's the same surface, it's isometric. And the proof basically goes, prove it for finite unions of, of disks, so finite domes, and then observe that every dome is a finite limit of these things, because given any surface, you can exhaust it by a finite number of disks, and then the domes of these things converge to the limiting dome of the whole domain, and a limit of isometries is an isometry. And so it's only enough to do it for finite unions of disks, like here's a union of two disks. You know, here's one circle here, here's another one, and the disk, the, the dome is as I've drawn it. And what I can do is these two disks meet along a geodesic. Let me try to draw it here. What I can do is there's a isometry of hyperbolic space, which is a rotation around that geodesic. If this geodesic was a vertical line like this, then rotating around it would be obvious. You would just take the Euclidean rotation around the vertical line. That would be an isometry, the hyperbolic metric. But when you have a, a geodesic like this, Hyperbolically, it's isometric to a vertical line. And so there is also a rotation around that. And what we do is we rotate around this until the two surfaces become flush. And what we get is a hemisphere. And it's easy to check by a direct calculation that the path metric on a hemisphere is in fact the same as the hyperbolic metric on the disk. So why is this an isometry? Well, if you have a path which is on the fixed part, it doesn't change at all. And if you have a path on the yellow part, it's moving by an isometry, it's just being rotated. So things don't change. The picture is exactly the same as in Euclidean space. If you had a, a drawing of a curve on a piece of paper and you folded that paper, the length of the curve doesn't change, it's the same thing. And so this is exactly what happens, is that when you have a finite dome, you can just fold the pieces till they become a hemisphere and this is an isometry. So this thing isometrically is the same as this because at each stage, you're just, you're just basically taking a pleated piece of paper in the plane, you could sort of think of it like this and you're stretching it out. And a curve on this pleated surface will stay the same. By, by, by full unfolding or folding the pleats, nothing changes. And so this is Thurston's, uh, Thurston's observation. What happens though, when you're doing this, 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 this folding, when you have these two disks and you have the two hemispheres and you're rotating around this geodesic, on the boundary plane, you're rotating around where those geodesics hit the boundary. And the mapping is exactly the same mapping we had before. So this idea of unfolding the surface on the base, it is exactly doing the medial axis flow. That's the connection between the two maps. And so the picture is this. We'd like to know the Riemann mapping from the base domain to the disk. That's hard to compute. But this 
unfolding map from the dome to the hemisphere, and then you trivially just project down to the disk. That's easy to compute. The only trouble is we really want, we haven't done the up direction yet. We want to go from the domain up to the dome, then over to the hemisphere, and then back down. And this is going to be the medial axis flow going up here. How do we go up? Okay. Well, the answer is the nearest point projection on the convex sets. When we're in Euclidean space and you have a point not on a convex set, you can just expand a series of balls around that point. And you keep expanding until you hit. And that defines a mapping of any point onto the convex set. Now, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping. You can have uh, two points, which both have a nearest point, which is a vertex. But this mapping is always Lipschitz. It's a pretty nice, pretty nice object. What's the hyperbolic analog? Well, this is in three dimensions, and it's hard to draw on a slide. So in this picture, R3 plus is up here, and the line down here is R2. So I'm looking at a vertical cross-section of hyperbolic space. So my domain omega is down here, and this is its dome, and this is the convex region, uh, which is above the dome. And if I take a point in here, what's the nearest point on the convex hull? Well, I expand hyperbolic balls around this until they make contact. And so this point will be the closest. And the terrific thing about hyperbolic space is that the nearest point contraction onto a convex set extends to infinity. If you take a point on the boundary at infinity, you can expand balls around this, but now the balls are not centered at that point. They're horror balls, which are tangent at that point. And so when you, um, this is the natural, uh, natural generalization of a ball at infinity, but you can expand the horror balls until they make contact. And so what you get is a mapping from the boundary at infinity up to the convex hull. Like the Euclidean case, you can easily have two points project to the same point. So it's not a homeomorphism, but this mapping is Lipschitz. And in fact, it's even better. It's what we call a quasi isometry, which means um, it's by Lipschitz on both sides if the points are far enough apart. So in this picture where you have two things going to the same thing, these things have to be about unit distance apart. If they're far enough apart, you're guaranteed that they go to different points. And so the dome is uh, quasi isometric to the to the base. And that's enough to prove that they're QC equivalent. There's a QC mapping from the dome to the base, which fixes the boundary points. And that's you know, what, what Thurston observed. It was actually first written down by Dennis Sullivan. Uh, this is called Sullivan's convex hull theorem, that the, um, that the, that the quasi-isometric constants are independent of what the base domain is, as long as it's simply connected. Even if it's not simply connected, we know how to, how to estimate what those, what those things are. So, so this theorem is, is uh, originally due to Dennis Sullivan. Uh, David Epstein and Al Martin did it in greater generality. Uh, I basically proved the best constants uh, known until recently. Uh, some people have improved my work. Um, as I said, Dennis had done this in the special case, assuming there's some invariance under a group of Mobius transformations. This has to do with three manifold theory. So uh, this picture arose when we're studying the uh, universal coverings of hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, and uh, Epstein and Martin extended it to general simply connected domains with a constant of around 85. And I was able to bring this under eight. Unfortunately, it's known that for this mapping, uh, there are some examples where you need at least two. If K had been equal to two, I'm pretty sure that would have implied a Fields Medal for somebody. Um, because had K been equal to two, it has many nice implications, which prove a number of important conjectures. Um, the proof that it's bigger than 1.2 is only applying to this nearest point, nearest point uh, mapping, though. If you could find some other mapping from the base to the dome, which satisfied k equals 2, other than the nearest map projection, like there was some other perturbation of it, and you could still get k equals 2, you could still be rich and famous. So that would, uh, that would be suffice for, uh, for some very, very, very nice uh, consequences. OK. So let me just spend the, um, the last few minutes of my time uh, describing some consequences of- uh, Chris, could I ask a quick question? Of course, you can ask. Uh, we're actually a little ahead of schedule, so you can ask uh, um, okay. as many questions as you want. I'm not short of time. The, the previous uh, theorem you mentioned, uh, so that, just to understand 
the K, so the, the boundary of omega, can that be like a non-rectifiable fractal? Yes. So oh, well. in this picture, omega is simply connected. Right. And what I mean is in full generality, it can be a fractal. It doesn't have to be locally connected. Um, you know, you can take, there are simply connected domains that sort of look like this, you know, where the, yeah. you know, this boundary component is not accessible. That's fine. The K is still less than eight, no matter what. Um, if you like, I could actually prove this for you. The proof of this with some general K, not the optimal one, fits on three or four slides. I actually put those slides at the end of my talk <laughs> because I didn't think I would have time to cover that during the talk. But if anyone you know, wanted to see it later, I can, in, in four or five slides, I can, I think, convince you that this, this nearest point projection has this property um, in, in about five minutes, in about 10 minutes. So that was actually my, my lovely contribution. I'm quite proud of that because there is this terrific paper by Epstein and Marden um, where, where they prove this theorem. And their paper is about 85 pages long. And I never got past about page 10 or 15. At that point, my eyes would water and my head would hit the desk. Um, so I just said, I have to understand this on my own. So I published an alternate proof in which the proof of this theorem is about one page. So, um, so this is a, a paper of mine in Annals of Math uh, back around, uh, I think, 2008 or nine. I could give you the reference if you want, but uh, I would go there first. And then I page, later did a, like a 20 page version of this which gives the um, which gives the seven point eight two, and then other people, mostly people working in hyperbolic manifolds, have been driving this down. So much, now it might be like seven point five or something. I mean, it's been brought down a little bit. Um, as I said, two is the magic number. Two would imply something called Brennan's conjecture, which has been open for almost fifty years. And so, um, but two point one doesn't imply it. <laughs> you need two. <laughs> um, uh, so, right. uh, I mean. 2.001, you know, would be probably improve what's known, but you really need to get quite close to do to to uh, to be famous. Um, unfortunately. Awesome. Chris, can I ask a question? Of course, we love uh, questions. So the example for 2.1 is the logarithmic spiral, right? Yes, that's right. So uh, that's due to and Marco, Vic, and Martin. I didn't write their names down, but that is so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there was a uh, yeah, there was an afternoon around the year two thousand when I thought I could prove to, and I was still under forty at the time, so I was thinking, hey, uh, but no, it didn't work out. I had, <laughs> I was mistaken. I couldn't. Prove uh, I think that. it's maybe it's Epstein. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, that 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 may be an exaggeration. I don't want to get anyone's hopes built up, but um, but it, it's but, but one of have, my. Do you have proof for for the log logarithmic spiral that you can use k equals two? No. I have not, uh, not tried so that. That's an example. To look that at. would, yeah. So there is an example, and if you can improve it, that would be obvious to try to prove it for for that. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a good feeling about it. So I haven't spent a lot of effort on that. Okay. So I think I've used up my margin of error now, and now I should get back uh, to the actual talk. So I just want to mention a couple of applications of this, which I am fond of. Um, this is the one that's sort of more for um, experts. But one of the consequences of, of the ideas I've been telling you is that if you have any conformal mapping of a simply connected domain to the disk, you can factorize it into two pieces. One is a Euclidean Lipschitz map to the disk, and the second is a hyperbolic by Lipschitz map of the disk to the disk. So this is basically the medial axle flow. I haven't told you this, but when you do this flowing property on the disks, big arcs become smaller arcs, and you can prove this. And so long, long arcs here become shorter on the boundary, and you can prove that the extension to the interior more or less preserves this up to a constant. So what you can prove, to me it's interesting, is that any simply connected domain can be mapped one-to-one -one onto a disk by a contraction of the internal path metric. And you can even take, if you have a domain, you can take a, an in-radius disk. I can only prove that you actually have to take something which is about half as big. 
but then the whole thing can be contracted onto that by something which is a, an actual contraction in the path metric. Maybe this is well known, but I don't know any other way of proving it besides using this medial axis flow and, and proving it has this Lipschitz property. And then this thing, the quasi-hyperbolic thing, this is the quasi-conformal factor that comes from solving the Beltrami equation, the part that we're not really discussing today. But many, many theorems of geometric function theory would be trivial if the conformal mapping was a Euclidean Lipschitz map. If we always knew that when we conformally mapped into the disk, that the conformal mapping was a contraction, there's a long list of famous theorems which would be obvious. It's the fact that you have to follow it by the by Lipschitz thing, which messes things up. Um, and so to me, this is like a fundamental truth about geometric function theory that the ideal map, you wouldn't have to fix it. It would, it would just be the first thing. And so to me, this medial axis map by itself is already the interesting object somehow. And the Riemann mapping theorem, it was invented first, but somehow it's more ordinary to work with. It's a little more difficult. Let me try to make this more precise. Remember this picture I showed you of a dome? And what we were gonna do is we're gonna take these geodesic arcs and then we're gonna rotate around them and flatten them out to try to, uh, to make the, the thing into a hemisphere. Now on the base, remember the base points map upwards to the dome by the nearest point retraction. So given a point in the base and given this dome, there's this mapping upwards. And some of the points map to flat surfaces on the dome, and some of them map to these points, which are the corners, the geodesics, these things. And on the base domain, you get a nice picture like this. The white regions, um, like this one, these are the regions that map to a face. And the crescents that separate them, like this, are the things that map onto the geodesic. So these are the points where you can have two points on the base, they get identified up on the dome. So when you do the nearest point retraction, that whole line segment collapses to one point. And what the, what the, what the, what, what the folding operation does when you're, when you're making these angles and making all these things flush, it's collapsing the crescents down to nothing. It's making, it's taking these things which are identified and making them into a single point. And when you do this, you can do it continuously. And what the picture looks like is this. You get this mapping. And so the Riemann mapping doesn't obviously come with a, as the endpoint of a one of a parameterized family, but the medial axis mapping, the one that goes from here to here, it's actually naturally part of a one parameter family that starts with the domain you're interested in and ends up with the disk. And all you're doing is making these crescents thinner and thinner, okay? Now, on a technical level, this is really important because the part of the paper I'm not telling you about was Newton's method. Remember, we had to solve a differential equation and Newton's method converged as long as the, the dilatation was within some epsilon, some radius of convergence. And the iota map, we got the number eight. Well, eight might not be less than epsilon naught, but what you can do is form a chain of these scale domains so that the gaps between them are only epsilon naught. And the number of elements you need is eight over epsilon naught, elements in the chain. And now what happens is if you take the identity map from the disk to the disk, that's within epsilon of being the conformal map onto this region. So Newton's method converges. So using the identity map, you can get the conformal map onto this region. But now this map is within epsilon of being the map onto this region. So by the Newton's convergence, you can converge from that starting point to the, new, to the conformal map onto that region. Now you continue. And because the number of elements in the chain is bounded, you get a bounded amount of work to compute the conformal mapping onto the desired mapping. And so that's this angle scaling family, even if it wasn't of interest of its own sake, um, would be, uh, gets used in the proof of the, of the mapping theorem. The other thing that's kind of neat about this is I started by saying that mapping onto a simpler domain was kind of equivalent to cutting the domain up into simple pieces. And that's what we're seeing here. What we've done is we've cut the domain into pieces, which are kind of natural from the point of view of hyperbolic geometry. And the Riemann mapping is approximately the mapping that takes each of the gray crescents 
and just collapses it down to a, a circle. So we're just taking this crescent and squashing it. This squashing map is a Möbius transformation. So when you have a crescent, the thing that identifies the two edges is actually a Möbius transformation fixing the two endpoints. So when I map the white region here to the white region here, that's a Möbius transformation. And the next one is a Möbius transformation. The composition of Möbius transformations is Möbius. So every single white region here is mapped to a white region over here by a Möbius transformation. This mapping just consists of taking a domain, cutting it into pieces. Some of the pieces get thrown away and the rest are mapped, rearranged into the disk. It's like you're taking a, a jigsaw puzzle, you're cutting it up, you're throwing away some of the pieces and then rearranging the pieces as the disk. And the rearranging is not a translation or a rotation. It's not a Euclidean motion, but it's a Möbius transformation. It, it, it's a, a conformally natural thing. And so somehow understanding the Riemann mapping up to a, a bounded amount of error is just cutting the domain into pieces and rearranging the pieces into a disk. And so it's kind of like, you know, with a famous dissection uh, problem about taking two polygons and rearrange, cutting them into pieces and rearranging them into each other. This has a sort of similar feel to it. And then here are some other examples of, uh, of scaling families that map uh, more complicated domains to the disk. In general, here's a, 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 a little warning for you. Here is a domain that looks like this. So it has some interlocked fingers. And when you start to unwind it, these fingers actually overlap at this point. So the intermediate domains don't have to be planar. For the construction in, in, in my paper, that doesn't matter. I just want the final mapping to be a one-to-one -one holomorphic mapping. If, if the intermediate mappings are not one-to-one, -one, doesn't bother me. But that is something that, that could happen in this particular morphing scheme. Um, in this scheme, all the crescents are being changed simultaneously. You have the freedom though, to change different crescents at different times. Instead of doing them all at once, you could do this arm first and leave the other arm alone. So you could bring this arm out, wait, and then bring this arm out later on. So you have lots of freedom if you really wanted to preserve the, uh, the planarness, you can do that as well. So you can prove that there's a planar way of, of, of doing this as, as well. Um, the final application that I wanna mention is to meshing. Um, so we have some quadrilateral meshes. That just means all the pieces are, are quadrilaterals. Um, back in 2000, Marshall Byrne and David Epstein proved that any polygon can be meshed in order of n uh, quadrilateral meshes with an upper bound of 120 and uh, taking n log n work, okay? Uh, a simple application of Euler's formula shows that the 120 is sharp. You can't do better than that. So here's a sort of a sample quadrilateral uh, mesh. So Byrne had asked, if you could get a, a lower bound in the, as well as the upper bound. Now there's a little bit of a, a, a thing here that if you have a very small angle, like maybe that's 10 degrees here, you can't make it bigger. That small angle has to remain, you can't get rid of it. But what you can ask is that all the new angles you form have a lower bound. And I was able to prove this using the conformal mapping theorem, which I showed you earlier. So what I could prove is that every n-gon has a quad mesh which has the same upper bound and the, all the new angles that you form are at least 60 degrees. And you can do this in O of N work. Because this requires the mapping theorem, but you don't need the true conformal map. It's enough to get a sort of a one plus epsilon conformal map. And the basic idea is that um, you're gonna map the disk to your polygon. In the disk, you know how to break it up into pieces, which sort of look like quadrilaterals. And you're gonna transport these over. And if these pieces are small enough, the angles do not change very much because conformal mappings do not change the angles. Now, there are three or four problems with this picture, um, things that go wrong. For one thing, these are not really quadrilaterals. If you count, each thing actually has five vertices. So these are actually pentagons, not quadrilaterals. And so we have to fix that. We also have to fix uh, the problems to get O of N. If you just use the picture I've drawn, you're going to get something that just may be much, much bigger than this. So you have to address that. But this is going to be the topic of my, uh, of my next talk. And so I'm going to start tomorrow's talk with this picture. And this is the beginning of, uh, of that talk. In the meantime, you've been very patient. I appreciate uh, your, your patience and listening to it. 
Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have. Okay, well, thank you very much for that beautiful talk. And let's, uh, by thanking uh, Chris for, for giving it. And now uh, to, to ask questions, perhaps raise your hand in the chat and, uh, and I'll call on you uh, in the order that I see your hands. Assuming I do see it. Uh, raise I your see hand. some hands up. Okay. okay why so don't I can... you call on them, Chris, because I can't see them. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's a Yin Yin Wu. I see a hand. Why don't you go okay. first? And then there is a Ulrich. Yeah, unmute yourself and ask a question after your name. Yeah, just there. be bold. Just shout it out. Oh, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, I just want to say that. Okay, well, thank you very much. I was a little concerned if I understood the audience well enough to, uh, to give a good talk, but um, um, they, they told me it was for graduate students and postdocs and, and people who wouldn't know these topics. And so I tried to, to avoid, uh, avoid details in favor of sort of giving the, the broad outlines. Plus, if you've been to any of my talks, you know that I always avoid the details, I always give broad outlines. So it was just sort of standard for me. Um, there was another hand up, I think Ulrich, was it? Um, if not, uh, please, uh, please shout it out. I'd also be happy to hang out later in between the uh, lectures and, or you know, it's, it's kind of intimidating to ask a talk in front of a hundred, ask a question in front of a hundred people, but. Um, well, uh, let me ask a question. Uh, this epsilon zero that you have on uh, yes. here, is, is there an explicit bound for that uh, in terms of- uh, No, so. Um, Yeah, so it's about more than 10 years since I wrote this paper. And that section of the paper was one of those things which you write and put it in the literature, hoping that no one will ever look at it and not planning to ever look at it yourself again. Um, basically, as I said, it was a sort of Newton's method in which if you have a small dilatation, then you solve the linear version and you, know, you show that the contribution of the square and the cube and the higher order terms is small by comparison. Um, that whole procedure is quite complicated and I suspect it is not numerically stable. So I'm assuming all sorts of things like I have infinite arithmetic. I can add any two real numbers I want in unit time. Um, I have this nasty feeling that some of the matrices I'm using are probably not very well conditioned and that if you actually threw this onto a computer, it would start complaining immediately. And so I was never really too concerned with uh, figuring out if, uh, if the more detailed parts of it would work. I would expect though it would be pretty reasonable, not like on the order of a millionth, but my intuition is that probably something on the order of a 10th or, or something larger, conceivably even, you know, you know, quite large. But that's a, that's a part of it, which I did not um, look into. I'm not really skilled enough uh, to, uh, I read a bunch of papers about how to do fast Fourier transforms and how to do, do um, fast multipole and other things that are kind of applied but then I projected them into theoretical math space and used them as, as basically proofs. But I know that when you actually go to a computer and make things, you know, a computation, there are all kinds of issues of accuracy and numerical stability and, and, and things which I, I did not address. So I apologize, that was a- uh... Is there a question from Jason Lynch? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, so there is a lot of discussion of various approximations for these metrics and mappings. I'm curious, do we know the complexity of finding exact answers? Is it NP-hard? Is it even NP-space? That sort of thing? So which mappings are you asking about? The conformal mapping or this medial axis flow mapping? Um, the, most of the conformal mapping. So the conformal mapping, I would claim that my, uh, my algorithm shows that for a polygon, it's linear with the proviso that you don't get exact mappings, you get an approximation and that the, the linear, the constant in front of the end depends on how accurate you want the answer to be. And that this quasi-conformal distance is actually a very powerful metric. If you've approximated the schwartz christoffel parameters to within epsilon in that metric, you have certainly done it within epsilon or order of epsilon, mm -hmm. just in terms of the distance on the circle. But it's much better than that because if I know I just have an n-tuple correct to within epsilon on the circle, once points are within epsilon of each other, I'm not sure that they're in the right order anymore. But the QC mapping distance ensures they're in the correct order. And moreover, the QC mapping says that if you take that n-tuple and you blow it up by a Möbius transformation, you renormalize it. You take an 
you take a, a something of length one millionth and blow it up to unit length, that after you've blown it up, it's still accurate to an epsilon factor. And so it's a scale invariant uh, error, okay? And so it, it, it's much better than uniform error on the circle. So in that sense, I would like to think that it is, um, it's linear time. Now there's work by uh, Ilya Binder and Mark Braverman and others uh, who basically compute harmonic measure by, who compute the Schwarz-Christoffel parameters by doing the random walks and letting them run into the boundary and doing that millions and millions and millions of times until they can compute the harmonic measure of each of the, each of the arcs. And so they get the Schwarz-Christoffel parameters that way. That takes an unimaginable long amount of time. But in space, all you have to do is keep track of how many times you've hit each edge. And so once you do the simulation, you in increment the, uh, the counter and you forget. And so space-wise, it takes up almost no space. And so they've proven it's in p-space uh, to do those calculations. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, to me, you know, the time is somehow more relevant than the space. I, you know, when I do calculations for real, I'm more worried about how long I have to wait for the answer than how much memory I'm using, because usually most of the things I do don't fill up the memory. Um, but yeah, people have examined that. And, uh, but I'm, I'm very interested in this whole idea of what does it, what's the computational complexity of continuous algorithms as opposed to discrete algorithms. Charles Pfefferman has done a bunch of things about, you know, how fast you can estimate functions, you know, given, you know, derivatives of them. I mean, there's some, there's a handful of results in which people have sort of proven rigorous time estimates on solving a continuous problem. But I think that's a whole field which um, deserves to be sort of organized and, and brought together in some way. As far as I know, it, it's all kind of ad hoc. Certainly my, my, my part of it is this kind of ad hoc. It's very focused on this one particular problem of conformal mapping. Yeah, well, <clears throat> and we also have a lot more tools with exists R for all R and the existential theory of reals for uh, describing yeah. complexity of these continuous things. So, yeah, I don't know I'm enough complexity of theory of logic to, to really address the question more deeply than I have, but I would certainly love to learn more about it. It's, you know, it's... Uh... So we have time for maybe well, one you. very quick question. Uh, sure, uh, Tushar, I see your hands are up. There could be other hands up, but I can only see one page. So I'm only seeing about 20 or 30 people out of the hundred. So. I mean, if we don't have much time, Chris, I was just curious because you said you had some slides about the proof idea, but if it uh -huh. won't be done soon, it's fine. I'll study this. That will probably take five or 10 minutes. There's another talk in, in, in just two or three minutes, no, I think. I, I'll look at your slides. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, my slides are posted on my webpage. We can maybe meet in a breakout room later on or between talks or during lunch or something. Um, Sounds I will good. have to walk away from my computer once in a while during the day. So, um, but you can always send me an email or, or, or we can set up something. So I don't know if the, the organizers have set up some breakout rooms, maybe tomorrow morning before my first talk at 11, they could turn on the um, meeting at 10 o'clock Eastern time or something a little early. I'd be happy to join a little bit early if you, if you wanted to, to, to chat then. That would, that would be perfect. Thanks so much. Amazing talk as always. I always come back from one of uh, Chris Bishop's talks with 20, 30 more ideas and dreams than I came in. It's amazing. Okay. Okay. Well, That's thank you very much. Precedent. Good precedent for the for the remaining speakers. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.